where I can hide that wire. Somewhere. All right. Acts chapter 2. We are going to continue with this. And by the way, we will get back to that King James Bible study, or the, the history of the text and the King James Bible eventually. I, when I'm over in Europe, uh, Harry's going to take me. To, he's got some spots for us. And, and Harry said, there's a, a King James Bible Museum over there. And there's, there's some other things over there. So he's going to take me to some spots there and, and all that good stuff. So I'm looking forward to having some of that uh, stuff and bringing it back. And he said they have the original over there. I said, oh, there's originals over there. But he, he was talking about the 1611. <laughs> I thought that was good. But uh, that you'll really send those Greeksters for a loop, won't you? <laughs> but uh, anyway, he's, uh, he's pretty excited about some things he wants to show me over there, show us over there as we're over there. And we're looking forward to that, too. So Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. And we're going to talk about the Simple Truth series here, discipleship in the church. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about discipleship and where it takes place. But you're a perfect example of where it is supposed to take place. And uh, that's, that's actually where it does take place. And the connection between, you know, it, when we started this series off here a few weeks ago, we started with the simple truth about salvation from the scriptures, which is a very simple gospel message that is important for everyone to hear. Then we talked about the simple truth about baptism, how Christ is the door to heaven and baptism is the door to the local New Testament church. And I say local New Testament church, you know what I mean by that. I just mean the church. That's, that's what God is. It's a local visible body. That's, we don't believe in the universal invisible church theory that has been taught out there. You know, I think that theory has caused a lot of damage what it's done is it's caused people to neglect the, the, the church and go off and say that they can have Internet Christianity and everything else, you know, and, and that, that their church is this the, all one body, one invisible uh, uh, group. And that's not what the scriptures say. So anyway, but that that has been perverted. That's an Augustinian doctrine that came in. And it is it is definitely perverted uh, the uh, the truth of of the church in the scriptures. But discipleship is not separated from the Lord's church. It's, it's part of the great commission that we've been given is to make disciples. And that is done in the context of the Lord's church. That's where it's done. Today, you have the navigators, you have uh, crusaders for Christ, uh, or all these other uh, para-church groups that disciple people. Well, that's not where the promise is, and we're going to get to that today. The promise of perpetuity is to the Lord's church. It's not to any of those groups. It's not to Noah's Ark out there in, where's that at again, Cincinnati, somewhere over there. It's not, it's, there's no promise, I, there's no promise perpetuity for that. There's no promise perpetuity for the sword of the Lord. There's no promise perpetuity for any of these other things. God promised his church. You know, that's, that's who he promised. That's who he gave his promises to in that sense. So we'll get into that here uh, this, this morning. And uh, I think it'll help us to keep that simple. You know, as we're, Ryan's putting together these booklets and he's going to start putting them together uh, through these sermons and then we'll vlog them. This is what will explain to people the pattern that they're to follow from the book you know, on down the line to show them, because people need that. They need something. They need to be able to follow the truth. They need to have it, and we have it right here in this book, amen, in the King James Bible. Acts chapter 2, verse number 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray you bless us now as we look at, at discipleship in your church. And your commands and your instructions for us, they're very simple. Help us to follow them. Help us to teach others to follow them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The scriptures show the intimate connection of baptism with the local church. They show it connected. I mean, it, they're inseparable in that sense. When we say local church, we don't really need to add the word local because the church in scripture primarily deals with that local New Testament body of believers. Sometimes it's generically refers to the institution. Like I, I've said this before, and I've taught you this, that like when people say the home is in trouble today, they mean the institution of the home. They don't mean some one big universal invisible home that everybody lives in or that everybody assembles in uh, spiritually or no, they, they're talking about the institution of the home. That's it. So the, the Lord's church is 
is uh, local, visible, ba assembled, a baptized body of believers that follow the book. That's what, they, that's what their lives are around. And that's where discipleship takes place at. So number one, let's look at this. Discipleship is a command. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, without the local New Testament church, this wouldn't happen. That's the pattern, is that God says, look, Jesus talked about the church, and we're going to get to that, but he talked about discipling people. When someone gets saved, the Lord wants those people discipled. They, they need to follow the Lord. They need to be discipled, and where they're discipled at is in the, in the church. That's where they're to be discipled at. That's the, everybody else has another way to do things today. They have other things going on that aren't a part of the local New Testament church. Well, that's not scriptural. God's order is the church. That's that they would be saved, they would be baptized, and they would be members of local New Testament churches. I'm going to show you the importance of that a little bit later in this. But we're to teach those that are saved and baptized to follow Christ. Discipleship involves teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, where do we have all things? Right here. If you didn't have all things, you couldn't obey that. So in this book right here, I have all things that he has commanded me. Amen. That's a, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's good to be able to know that everything that God wants me to know is right here in this, in this book. This one, the one that I have in my hands. Amen. The one that I have that I'm holding, the one that I'm reading from, the words of life. Amen. That's literal, isn't it? It's supposed to be. Luke chapter 9, verse number 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. It is assumed here by our Lord that those that trust Christ as Savior follow him in baptism into his local New Testament church, and they are disciples, they are followers of Christ. There is nothing else that is taught in the scriptures that people get saved and baptized and they don't join churches and they're not members of local bodies and they don't serve the Lord. In fact, that's not even, like you can't teach people that anywhere, right? It's not there. That's not part of biblical Christianity. You're sitting in it right now. This is what God ordained. Now, I'll be honest with you, primarily Baptists are the ones that understand this and have in history. Most others haven't. They obeyed part of the Great Commission, but even, even George Whitfield and those other men that preached the gospel and saw many people saved, they didn't organize them into local New Testament churches. Who did? The Baptists did. Man, they, that's the first thing. Oh, there's a group of people gathered together that got saved. Well, that's why George Whitfield would say, all my chicks have turned to ducks. They sure have. Why? Because they truly got saved and they sought out the truth. And God, if you want it, God will give it to you. Amen. He'll, he'll give it to you. You're, you're living proof of it. You're sitting right here and you don't even, you're not, none of you are, most, well, some of you are, but most of you are not even from Minnesota. Right? Right. God's spirit. Well, you want it, you'll get it. Amen. That's assumed by the Lord that, that Jesus said the disciple will deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow the Lord. That assumes a continual relationship until they go home. I, I don't believe in this gospel that leaves people out of local New Testament churches. They don't follow the Lord. They don't get discipled. They don't want to grow. They don't want to live for God. And they, they, they don't have what you have here. I, I don't even believe that. It's nowhere in the scriptures that you see born again believers that have not, that care nothing for the church. Just not even there. Unless you're talking about John 666 disciples that turned away. They turn their back. They walk away. Those are there. So there is, in truth, there is some of that. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and his wife 
and wife and children and brethren and sisters. Yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. Jesus says plainly the life of a disciple is one of self-denial in being a follower of Christ. He's not telling us to hate everyone in the sense that, that you think in the modern sense of hating people. He's talking about the degree of love because he's going to go on and tell them, he says, that they that love more. And we'll get to that. He talks about that. So he's explaining that our love for Christ is to dwarf any love we have for others. That's what makes you, if your mom or your dad don't want to live for God or these other people don't want to, that's what makes you forsake them and follow the Lord. That's why, because your love for God is greater. Right? It's greater than, than any earthly connection. Amen. Jesus plainly uh, says plainly the life of the disciple is that way. Jesus also teaches that his disciples come after him. They follow him. They learn of him. The disciple is one who receives instruction from another and adherent to the doctrine of another. That's the definition. Jesus Christ demands total devotion from those that will be his disciples. He demands, he demands a total surrender from them. Not to be saved. Because they're saved. There's no earning it. There's no working for it. I'm trying to get God to be happy with me. No, 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 no. It's because of. Because you're his child, you surrender. You want to surrender to him. You want to obey him. You want to follow him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus' disciples continue in his word. They don't turn away from it. They continue in it. Not to be saved, but because they are saved. They are his. They continue in it. That word disciple is, is the word most often used in the New Testament to describe those who follow Christ. The Great Commission is to result in the multiplication of disciples. We learn that in Matthew chapter 28. In Acts chapter 11, verse number 26, it says here, And when, the, when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. They said, what do they do? They assembled with the church. Why wouldn't you? It don't make any sense to me. Why people wouldn't. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So those disciples of Christ they called them Christians. Why? Well, you think they watched it? Oh, those are followers of Christ. They're assembled together in one body following Christ. The same thing you and I are doing. Same thing in this church. You're assembled together and we are following Christ. That's what we're here to do, amen? In the parable of the sower, though, we see that there are different types of those that believe. True believers are Christ's disciples. If you would be a Christian, you would be a disciple. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. The parable of the sower talks about four different types of ground of believers. It explains that some are part-time believers. You know, they just give up and walk away. Mark chapter 4, turn there. We're going to read a section of that. Help us understand. It's only the, the last ground that are the fruitful ones. Every Christian is fruitful. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Every single Christian in this room right now that is a born-again saint has been fruitful. There is fruit there. That's, that's the guarantee of the child of God. The true believer is fruitful. Mark chapter 4, verse number 4, And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and it did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Three grounds are the same and one is different. The one ground that is different is the fruitful ground that bears much fruit, bears different amounts of fruit. Each Christian will bear different amounts of fruit. Jesus explains that in verse 14, the sower soweth the word. That's this. 
Gotta have it to sew it, right? We have it right here. And they and these are they in verse 15, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And and these are likewise they which are sown on stony ground. Who, when they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So much that they walk away like John 666. They're done. You know, anything to do with the Lord. I didn't say they're done with the church and they go join another one. No, I'm saying they're done with the Lord. They walk away. They don't want anything to do with God. And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enter in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, some a hundred. These are fruitful Christians. These are born-again believers. These are disciples of Christ. That's the people in this room that have been saved by the grace of God. You look around you. You can see the fruit. Visible, right? You can see it. Christians, God, Christian, God believes in multiplication. We, we multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. God, every single person in here has that aspect that has been saved by the grace of God of multiplication. They can look around and they can see it. I can see it in your families. You were, some of you were saved long before you ever had children. And you look down and you see your children. Now you see some of your children married. And, they're, and they have a wife and they, they have ch children and they're serving the Lord. What is that? That's multiplication. That's fruitfulness. That's the fruit. It beareth fruit. Amen. That's God's way, isn't it? There, so that's, that's what God does. That's the work that God does. So that's the work that you and I are commanded to do. All true followers produce fruit. They grow. They learn. They're disciples of Christ. They reproduce after their own kind. That's what God does. He does that work in them. I can tell you this. Before I was saved, I had a lot of works that I'm ashamed of. But I'll tell you what, when God saves you and changes you and washes you, he gives you a lot of new works, doesn't he? Things that were never, you never lived that way before. You never loved those things before. God gave them to you. He made you love them. He changed you. They're also called sheep, aren't they? God's people. They're called sheep. They're to be in a flock. John 10, 26, but ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Sheep don't turn into goats. Amen. Now, here is where that transition into where the primary discipleship of the believer or the Christian takes place. Because sheep are to be in a flock, if you are a sheep, then you should naturally want to be with other believers. So how then are men and women discipled? Number two, the local church is the primary place for that discipleship. It is God's ordained way. Now you have the internet of which we use you know, to help others and to preach the gospel and to get the truth out there and to go everywhere that we can to, to bring that. And others use to preach the gospel and teach men the scriptures. But the unique thing about our online ministry is this, is that it is out of a local New Testament church. That's, that's the difference. It is a ministry of Old Past Baptist Church. That's what it is. What we are doing is a outreach. It is a ministry. It is an evangelism of Old Paz Baptist Church. One of the many ways that we do when we all get together as men and go out into the streets and preach the gospel, that is a ministry of Old Paz Baptist Church. That's what we're doing. We're ministering. We're out there preaching the gospel. And the unique thing about it is that God has honored those ministries and he's blessed them. and He's given something that a parachurch organization doesn't have. Perpetuity. 
there's a lot of these online preachers and teachers out there that are running around with no authority, doing whatever they want to do, running around, teaching all kinds of crazy things to people. And, and they don't have the blessings of God as God gives to his church. They don't have the promises of God. Turn to Matthew chapter 16, please. Jesus gives these instructions. He says this, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God's churches are promised perpetuity. God said that he would always have a church, that he would always have churches here. It's promised that Christ will breathe life into it and that the candle will not go out if they continue in his word. Amen. So then if you would be discipled, it should be through his church. That is the place of all true discipleship. The church is the proving ground for disciples. Nothing tries a believer's faith like being in a church. Nothing. Man, you can be the best Christian you know when you're not in church, when you're away from, when you get in church and we're all together and we all have to learn to love one another and, and our patience is tried, this is where your love is tried. This is where you, the trial of your faith is. This is where you learn to love people is right here in this church. Not just the immediate people that are in your family that you know, uh, or those that are in submission to you or, or anything like that, but, but other brothers and sisters in Christ that you all have, we all have different personalities. We all have different thoughts and different understandings and, and, and we all come from different backgrounds and things like that. But guess what? The church, God says, no, you're all baptized into one body. You're all together. So guess what? You got to love each other. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Love is the defining attribute. It's the one that, that is seen. God doesn't say that to lost people because they don't know how to love. They can't love Christ's way. Their love is putrid. It's putrid. It's wicked. It's not, it's not biblical love. That's why, why do you think when you go out there and you preach biblical love to them, they look at you like you hate them. They look at you like a rebellious child that's going to get a spank and looks at you when they're done wrong. You don't love me. That's well, just the opposite. We do love you. It is love. That's what love is, is correction, instruction, telling people the truth. It's not love to lie to them. The church is that proving ground, though. Look what Ephesians 5 says, what the Lord does with this. Ephesians 5, good lessons for husbands, but also for the church. He, Christ explains this. Paul explains this. He was given the mystery of the revelation to explain all these things, and Paul explains them. He says in Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. For what reason? that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The church is to be cleansed by the washing of water by the word. Right here. It's the word of God that cleanses the church. Jesus uses it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, right? That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So then Jesus died for the church and he desires that believers in Christ that are true disciples of the Lord are washed in the word in the church. He didn't give it to campus crusaders. He didn't give it to the navigators. He didn't give it to AA or the Billy Graham Association. It's the church. He gave his commission to the church. The church is to make disciples. That is their primary concern after the glory of God, of course, is to preach the gospel and to make disciples. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, please. We're given instructions here. Paul is going to explain some things about the church, the body. And by the way, the importance of this is going to come when you really analyze and look at Jesus' words. Because there's some things that happen to, to Christians, and we need to understand that, and how God gave us the church for that reason. Ephesians 4.4, 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every one of us are given grace to exercise where? Here. Now look at verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Jesus gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascendeth up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles. Amen. Some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Where are the saints perfected? In the church. He gave the gifts. He gave the offices. He gifted each person in the assembly with certain spiritual gifts, but he also gifted them pastors and teachers. And just like you're going to see men teach and preach the Bible to you when we're gone. Why? Because he's gifted men with that in his church to be used in his church. What's the purpose of it for the perfecting of the saints? That's the purpose. God gave you one another for your perfection. I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to look around and understand. Those that are not here, uh, they're included in this. But I want you to understand that, that God gave them, God gave us one another for our perfection. To mature us. To make us what God, and by the way, that means every single one of us. Do you understand that? There isn't anybody left out of that. That's all of us. All of us that were baptized into that one body. All of us that are a part of that. All of us that are here. All of us that are saved and baptized. God gave for the perfecting of the saints. To mature us. To make us what God wants us to be. For the work of the ministry. The perfection is for what? So I can brag about how good I am. No. No. It's for work, for the work of the ministry, and, get, and, for, and for what else? For the edifying of the body of Christ. That's you. That's us. For our edification. All of us are here for the edification, not the condemnation of each other. You understand that? We're here for the edification of one another, not the condemnation. Everything that we do ought to be in a constructive manner in order to edify our brethren. Now, sometimes that, that involves correction and instruction, and that doesn't feel good. That doesn't, that doesn't make us feel really great sometimes. That's really hard to take. But you know what? It's for our edification, not our condemnation. That's, there is no condemnation in them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There, there's no condemnation. Everything that, that God does here is not for anyone's condemnation for our edification. And each one of you play a part in that edification. Each one of you, male, female, doesn't matter. You, child, you play a part of the edification of the saints. You're part of the gifts to the body. It matters what you do. It matters that you, and it matters that you're faithful and you're in the place that God wants you to be. I'm gonna tell you what. I understand being sick and not coming in and, and things like that, I, I get it. I, I don't want you to come in puking and hacking everywhere and making everybody sick and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, the, but barring that, don't let them, that, or, you know, you have to sleep or whatever. I, I get it. Okay, work and stuff. That, those things come up. But barring those things, don't keep yourself away from the house of God. The church, your brethren need you. See, I don't feel like, to, yeah, I don't, yeah, you may not feel like it. Maybe you're going to do something to help somebody there. Maybe they need you there. And you, and you don't come. I understand, like I said, sick, tired, and working and all that. Well, we get it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just don't let anything else keep you from your place of faithfulness. Don't let the devil get into your mind and keep you away. Discourage you and say, well, I'm not going to show up today. Don't let the devil do that to you. 
Don't let your fallen flesh feed into that and do that. There's a purpose for you to be here. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. He's not leaving anybody out. All of us. We, the church is like, it's one body, and you know who I'm talking. I'm talking to you when I say the church. It's just like when I say the scriptures. I'm talking about this. When I say the church, that's you. I'm talking to you. That's us. Us, okay? I'm not, I'm not speaking of some universal invisible book that's not here, and I'm not speaking of some universal invisible body that's not here. I'm speaking of literal here. I'm talking to us, and I'm talking about a book that I can hold. I don't believe in them fairy tales those boys tell about their spiritual stuff that ain't around. I believe what I got right in front of me and what I'm seeing right before me. Amen. Better remember that. I'm getting excited now. Yeah. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Together. We are, we are one body marching to Zion. Do you understand that? We're not just a bunch of separate people that gather together in that sense. No, we are one body marching forward with our armor on headed to Zion. That's who we are. That's, you have to, that's the importance of the believer and that's the importance of the disciple being in the local New Testament. This, that's why God gave us this. I believe that. Otherwise, I wouldn't travel all across the, 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 the ocean or wherever I'm going, Andrew. I'm not good with those. But somewhere I'm flying over that way, somewhere, eight hours. I don't know. I'll wake up sometime and I'll be over there on the other side of the pond. But, uh, and and I'm, not, I'm going over there because I believe that. I believe that everyone ought to have what we have. Don't you? You know, I, I'll tell you what. There, there, there's a temptation. Let me, let, let me share with you a temptation that I... That, that, that I had here in that sense. There is a temptation for me to look at somebody, like even, I, I thought about Carl and Mary and their situation, how they had like a church that over there they were visit that doesn't preach repentance, doesn't preach keepers at home, doesn't teach the things that, biblical things, just biblical, Christ, like, like this, like out of the book, right? And just teach it straight and plain and simple for men to understand. And my temptation was, I'll be honest with you, say, well, uh, at least they have a place to go. I, I thought about that. I just, I, th I said that to myself and I thought, you know what? Is that what you would do? Is that what you would want? Is that what you would want for your family? No, I wouldn't. So why would you want any less for them? And that stuck me. It caught me. I was like, oh man. Yeah, why would I? Amen. Amen. So we press on. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Mature. This body is to mature us. You understand that? It's to mature us. Every single one of us, this body is to mature us in the faith. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a question and then an answer to that question real quick. So, Pastor, are you saying that Christians, Bible believers that don't, that aren't a part of a local New Testament church will never mature as God wants them to? Yes, that's what I'm saying. I, I believe that. Don't you? I have to believe that. Just like I have to believe that this book is perfect. I, I have to. If I didn't, I'd be doing something else. I, wouldn't I? That God perfects his saints in his church. To, unto a perfect man, to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ. Guess what? That's not the measure of you and I. We don't, <laughs> uh, comparing ourselves among ourselves is not wise. Right? So it's looking at each other and thinking, well, I'm better than them. I'm better than this guy. Or No. Christ. Christ is the measuring stick. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's how God wants you to mature. The only place you do that 
in the church. That's where. Why do you think it's so hard sometimes? Why do you think it's so challenging sometimes? Why do you think you're tempted to avoid the Lord's church? Why do you think you're tempted to, to um, uh, rebel or you're tempted to be discouraged or you're tempted to any? Why do you think that is? Because it's to mature you. And it's hard. It's a war with the spirit and the flesh. It's, it's a battle. It's not easy to mature and to grow up. Right? It isn't easy to grow up and be like, you got to grow up. You got to stop doing that. That's what the church does. That's what the Lord uses it for. That you, you, you got to grow up. You can't act that way. You got you to gotta be mature. You can't do this any longer. God's not going to accept that from you any longer. You've got to mature through. So when you're confronted with wrongdoing or you're confronted with, uh, you know, uh, um, learning that of something or, or that, that you're wrong about, you don't go pout in a corner about it and, and, and stomp your feet and cry and whine. You get up and you obey the Lord. And you do what God has called you to do. Amen. That's what we do. We learn the truth from the book. We see it. We follow it. But that, that happens in the church. That maturity comes there under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Baby Christians are unstable. They're all over the board everywhere. Whew. I mean, they're, they're tossed to and fro with everything. Every trial that comes in their life, every challenge that comes in their life, everything, they're tossed to and fro. They're taken aback. They're taken off by everything that comes. But the church is here that you be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You're not taken by deception. You're not taken by those other things. You're not, you're not tossed all over the place and not stable. Unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The church is to grow you. Grow, like, like, there is, you're not supposed to stay the same as you were when you got saved. You're not supposed to. The day you got saved and, the, and when you got saved, God, God saved you and you know what? You're a baby and God says, okay, you're going to grow. And you're going to have growing pains. And this church has growing pains. We have them. We have them. People misunderstand each other. People get upset with each other. All those things happen. Those things are all common. But what's to overshadow all of that is our love for God and one another. And that we mature, we're like, you know what? I'm not going to let this move me like that. I'm not going to let it sway me. He says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. We're here to edify one another in love. Now, I want you to considering all that, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, considering the body comes together, considering all those things. Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse number 34. Because Jesus said when he was come, when he come to establish his doctrine and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and, and warning men and everything else, that something was going to happen when the gospel is preached. Just like for each one of you, something happened when you got saved. Uh, something happened and it changed things with people that weren't saved. It, it, it changed things. Now, some of you were young and you wouldn't, you would be sheltered from some of those things and that's okay. But as you get older and you find that you follow the scriptures more, you're going to find that your mom, your dad, your friends, your other acquaintances, other people in the faith, they, they aren't really too keen on your separation and your walk with God. They, they don't really like it that much. 
In Matthew 10, 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Jesus says, remember that verse that he talked about hating? He that hate not his father and mother. Well, he ex this explains what he means here in verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. The fact is that you and I are not to love our families and our earthly friends more than we do God and more than we do the truth. Many of you had to walk away from family. Many of you had to separate from family. Many of you can't have that close relationship with family because they don't walk with God and they don't like your walk with God. And what happened? A sword, the promised sword that Jesus said. Here's the sword. Here's the sword. This book preached... It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And what does it do? It divides. It divides. That's its purpose. Here's the dividing of soul and spirit, right? The Bible says it divides. The book divides. That's what it does. The gospel divides. Christ divides. His word divides, right? Now, most Christians out there come to a point in their life where they where when, or once they, they newly get saved and they find out that none of their family is interested in the gospel that they preach, none of their family is interested in living for God, or most of them aren't, and they, they, there's a sharp divide there that takes place. That's very unbearable at times for them to walk away from loved ones who will not be able to tolerate our Christian life, or they live wickedly, or they're heretics, or you know they're following a cult, false religions, and those things. And you have to walk away from these loved ones. But do you understand that God gave you something new? That you are given that's more than able to fill the void and replace it with God-centered love? And that's his church. See, you have a lot of people out there that live Christian lives and they don't have a local New Testament church. They're not in a church. And when their family forsakes them, they become absolutely depressed, broken down, not encouraged, and, and discouraged and tempted to walk away from the Lord to, because of their relationships that are shattered. But the reason that they're like that, they become so discouraged, not that it won't be discouraging, but the reason they are is they've only obeyed part of the command. They came out from among them, but they didn't, they didn't go to the Lord's church. They didn't become disciples and follow Christ in his church. The relationships and the love that we have here, most people don't have that around the world. A lot, a lot of Christians don't have that. They don't have that personalized care one for another. They don't have that body of believers that come together, that pray for one another, that help each other, that, that, that fellowship with each other that replaces the void of those relationships that they can't encounter or be close to anymore. They don't have that. Many people suffer because they forsake the church. Many decide, or believers in Christ that I believe get saved, they lose that love and fellowship and they lose their steadfastness and they stumble because they're not in church. They don't have the Lord's church to grow in. So they get, they, they have a void there. And God says, you're not supposed to have a void there. I gave you my church. I gave you, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I gave you my church to be a part of. That's what the disciples did in Acts chapter 2. When they got saved, what did they do? They that gladly received his word were then baptized and were added unto the church daily, such as should be saved. They added to, they automatically, they were done. The old life, man, it was over. They, they were going to be hated because they were Jews. But God gave them the church. And the Holy Ghost in them as believers, but also 
in the body, assembled together. Many people, they don't follow God's way of discipleship after they, many believers and being a part of a local body. Christ has an intimate connection with his little flock. The whole reason I believe the Lord has taken care of this ministry trip and everything that he has provided for us and will bless it is because of his church. I believe that. The reason the online ministry has been blessed the way it has is because his church. This is his church. That's a ministry of his church. That literally nearly millions have heard gospel messages all around the world from this little church. Because the Lord promises his churches perpetuity. Those believers come together in the local church. They're called his body. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You understand what the Lord's body is, don't you? How the church is a picture of his body. It is his body, spiritually, literal, local, body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. God never meant for sheep to be alone. God never meant for you to be alone. He meant for you who are saved to be in local New Testament churches, for you to serve the Lord and be a part of the body. And the church is the primary place for instruction. Look at the text again, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Ephesians 4, 14, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The church is to correct us and give us uh, through the scriptures and, and give us those, and God gave us those offices. He gave you a pastor. He gave the elder brothers and sisters in Christ to the edification of the saints. This is the perfecting ground, and there is no other place you need to be than his church. Till you go to heaven. You know, there are all kinds of crazy doctrines and things that are taught out there, but if you want to grow and be what God wants you to be, you need to be discipled in a Bible believing Baptist church. That's God's way. By the way, look at the end of the Revelation in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 4. He's speaking to the churches. Look what he says John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from, the, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You know that, again, that he might receive glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. You know, you, you glorify God best when you're in the place that God has, has called you to be, right? When you're, when you're faithful to God, when you're faithfully in the place that God has for you. That God means for every single born-again believer to find a church and join it, a biblical church, and join it and be a part of it and serve the Lord. That's how they're discipled and that's how they're perfected. And you know what? It really doesn't matter where you live or where you are. If you can find a way to get there, you ought to. You ought to. There's people, you, you, you hear testimonies of that, that you've traveled all over the country to be here. To serve the Lord. Because you believe in the Lord's church. You believe in what God said about it. People that believe, they're followers. People that tell me they believe, but they don't follow Christ at all. I'm not saying if they're not in a church always. What I'm saying is that they follow Christ. They, they, they have a desire to follow Christ. But I will say this, that the pattern that we see in the scriptures is believers join churches. They're part of New Testament bodies. And that body is edifies them and perfects them. You here are all, all here today to edify and perfect one another to worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth, and to edify and to love one another. 
right? The challenges that we face and the different, this, this church is sending Brother Andrew and I over there. This church is doing that. That means that this church is to edify and to perfect one another and be there for each other through all the trials and all the challenges and everything that, that we face. That we're to be together one for, and don't neglect the blessing of the church. Don't neglect one another in your sorrow and your pain and your suffering and your trials. Don't neglect each other. Don't neglect to get the comfort that God has for you through all of those things by neglecting his church and by neglecting the brothers and sisters in Christ that are to be there for you. Don't do that, right? We're, we're, to, we're to be there one for another. We're to pray for one another. We're to edify one another. We're to strengthen one another. It happens in the Lord's church. That's what that's that's where disciples are made. Hey, Amen. That's where they're made. That's where they're developed. That's where they mature. Amen. That's what we're here for. We need to always remember that. Never forget that. The importance of it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. And Lord, we thank you for the edification that you give us through the book and through your church, Lord. But we can take the book, and we're washed by the word, one another, one another in the word, Lord. And that we're encouraged one by another in the book. And Lord, that you would just help us, guide us and direct us. Use your church, Lord, protect it. Use us as we do your will and your way, Lord. And we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for all that you do for us. Strengthen our hearts. And help us to preach the gospel to many. They'd be saved, that they'd be changed, that their lives would be different, that we would see churches spring forth from this church, Lord, as these young men that you would call them to preach. Call them, Lord, and, and, and lead them to preach the gospel, and Lord, even to pastor one day some of them, and, and that this church would produce more churches. By the glory of God, we know you'll do it, Lord, because you promised in your word, the gates of hell shall not prevail against your church. Thank you for your promises, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.